This session is called Ways to Get Students to Come Back to Class. And your presenters, they'll introduce themselves in a minute, but um, let's welcome Marlene Graff and Jennifer Gree. Thanks so much, you guys. Um, we are gonna introduce ourselves by telling you a few things that we have in common. So first, I'm Marlene Graff. I teach in the Department of Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Sciences. And this is my colleague, Jen Gruy. Yeah, and I teach in the um, psychology department. I'm an assistant professor in the psychology department. And I'm also the director of our first year experience program on campus called Connections. Okay, so here's one thing we have in common so far. We both started new hobbies this year. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I feel like I've reached a midlife crisis, so I need new hobbies. <laughs> so my new hobby is cycling, and Jen's new ho hobby is golfing. Oh, yeah, golfing. golfing. Yeah. I started golfing. <laughs> I was like, Marlene, I've completely forgotten <laughs> yeah. what we talked about. Yes. <laughs> what are my hobbies? Also, we both went on little family vacations to the West Coast. I went to Oregon in March. It was cold. And Jen? I was in Newport, so it was really warm and fun. Played so. the beach. Next time, I'll go later in the year. Yeah. Also, we um, both have kind of an ag background, and so we spent more than a few hours on the back of a horse, long enough that we can both say we've been thrown from a horse before. Yes. I, I, ooh, to be honest, I think I was kind of throwing my leg over, and the horse went. So I'm not sure. Marlene, actually. Yeah, I've done, more of I've done the real deal. Okay. And then we've also taught at Utah State for 10-plus years. So in this session, here's our description, but basically we're gonna talk about how um, to encourage students to actually come back to your in-person class uh, post COVID. And we're gonna talk about some of the challenges that we've had and some of the th things we've tried and how that's gone. And hopefully you'll uh, gain some new ideas and, and they'll learn from a few things we share. So here's an outline. We're gonna briefly talk about challenges that we've noticed and then we're going to talk about interventions and we're going to talk about two primary ones and just kind of our thoughts about how to change in class participation and activities and instruction but then also um, kind of the philosophy between behind incentives versus punishment and then we'll share some examples of what that's looked like in our respective classrooms so the slides that have purple are Jen's slides, the slides that have blue are my slides, so we'll kind of switch back and forth. Perfect. Um, yes, you'll notice Marlene's slides are always really nicer looking than my slides, but that's good, that's okay. Um, so this last uh, year, we've really noticed that um, particularly, Attendance in face-to-face -face classes have been a challenge. I teach large general education classes. Um, just to give you a little brief um, idea of where I was coming from, uh, prior to the pandemic, right before the pandemic, I actually had a baby. So I was off um, for a semester, pandemic hit. I didn't go back to face-to-face -face teaching until spring of 2022. So this last spring. Um, so it was quite a while because of some of the really, really large classes I taught. Um, attendance, I noticed, uh, was different. Typically, I, I, pri I kind of prided myself on, I'd usually get 80% or more of my really large classes attending. Um, it was a lot lower this year. And a lot of those, a uh, lot of reasons for those non-attendance um, in those face-to-face. Became a struggle to. Uh, I had this. This I, I knew I wanted to provide recordings, be able to keep students up if they had to stay out of class for a period of time, but it was it was kind of this, this love hate because I also hated doing that. I um, recordings from a classroom often were like the worst to to watch and to um, try and learn from. I teach my online content entirely different than I do my face-to-face. -face. A lot of times I think people have this perception with online that we just record ourselves teaching a face-to-face -face and we plop it online. And that's not how it is supposed to work. This was supposed to work as a little bit of an assist for students that had to be out for a week. But what I found was a lot of students were almost taking advantage of this. 
that I would post these recordings every time and they'd say, I'll just stay in my dorm. It was interesting. They'd say, I want face-to-face -face classes, but oh, now we're here and it's just a lot more comfy to stay in my pajamas in my dorm and just watch the terrible recording of Dr. Gruy talking about the material. Yeah, another thing I've noticed is um, what I call pandemic freshmen. So the the incoming class in 2020 and 2021, they didn't have a, a very traditional uh, college transition. And so in, in some of my conversations with this particular group of students, it, I would say that there's a higher level of anxiety and social awkwardness, and they're not quite sure how to come back, or they they don't know what to come back to, I guess, because there wasn't this experience to begin with. So that's been kind of interesting to navigate. You can go to the next one. Also, the logistics of switching back was hard for me because I think all of us invested so much time in you know transferring our content so that it could go online and 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 so I had some resources that were fully online that I didn't want to just you know throw away or give up and so I was trying to figure out what of that what parts can I keep and still make work in this you know kind of new realm so that was a trick too so let's talk about our interventions um, one thing that ended up being kind of a nice um, aspect of all of this was so I had this period of time I was on online I'm sure like many of you the first few weeks I was like this is great and then the first few months I was like ooh and then the last few months I'm I mean it was I realized this isn't why I got into teaching it was I was sick of it and so coming back in the spring of 2020 I had this newfound love for teaching and I wanted to kill it I was like I am gonna knock it out of the park we're gonna have a it's gonna be a party every class time and then they and then I showed up that first few days and people weren't coming so I knew I needed to um, do some intervention so um, some of the in-class uh, ideas, and I'll talk about um, some of these in more detail in a minute, but um, I, I tried to create more fun within the classroom. I did this in a variety of different ways. Um, one I'll talk about in a little bit, I tried to use a lot of gaming. Um, I, and if it wasn't a game, I tried to organize things in a, activities in ways that it had elements of gaming. Um, I did a lot of uh, hands-on demos. I asked for volunteers almost every single class. Sometimes I'd email out and say, hey, if you want to volunteer for this next class, let me know. And so I had students coming excited to be able to engage in something um, really hands-on. I um, did small group discussions. I, I know that we talked in the last session about some of the you know hit and misses with the small group discussions. But even in my large class, I really tried to do a lot of the think, pair, share ideas um, with those students, and that tended even the students that didn't really want to participate or do a hands-on kind of experiment, they found um, that they could participate when it was a really small uh, think, pair, share. And then this idea of gamification of content. Um, I'm trying to decide how much I want to talk about that right now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give some examples of that in just a few minutes. So in, uh, incentives versus punishments. So I... I, I've been on both ends of this. Um, there have been years where I thought I'm going to, I did pop quizzes a lot. Um, I would, and the students would never know, and if they missed a pop quiz, it dinged against their grade. And I did that for a lot of years, and it worked. You know, students would come. And it, you know, I did this random um, kind of variable reinforcement schedule of them not knowing. So like gambling, they're like, yeah, I'm gonna keep pulling that lever because never know when the pop quiz. But um, I, I didn't love the idea that I was kind of punishing the students, and I felt like there were so many things that were so punishing these last few years that I tried to really shift how I approach a lot of my activities so that they're more incentivizing rather than punishing. Um, and I'll explain uh, some specific examples in a little bit. Um, yeah. 
So I just want to add a few more thoughts to what Jen said. said. Um, I found this, um, let's, this article, I guess, and it was talking about whether or not um, student attendance in person in class matters. And here's what they found. This was a survey among faculty members, by the way. And the conclusion stated that faculty member job satisfaction was higher when students came, which that made sense to me. And also, faculty were more willing to incorporate active learning strategies and some of the things that Jen talked about if, if attendance was higher. So you can go to the next one. So there's lots of active learning stuff. And so this is just a resource slide if you want to include more in your classroom. But I found that uh, finding interesting. And so you can go to the next one. And so I thought, well, I wonder <laughs> like how, how to bridge that gap so that it's working for me, but also for them. So in that same paper, they also said that many students choose not to attend class because they have this belief or perception that viewing recordings is more efficient, more convenient, and more effective than in-person attendance. Because you can go exercise or whatever and listen to a recording, right? So, so I think the challenge is overcoming or getting them to challenge this a little more. Because my experience has been that I have students who have done pretty well, actually, in an online format. And so they think, well, I'm getting by. And so why, why change? But I want, like, my uh, goal now is to get them to at least try it. So if you'll go to the next one. I, um, I have a little girl who's five. Me and Jen actually had babies about the same time. So I know I'm like 40 years older than she is, but um, but all the parenting books that I seem to find really talk about the drawbacks to punishment, um, especially the long-term drawbacks. And so, like, I I uh, make connections all the time between parenting and teaching. But if you go to the next one, they like there's also this um, like research that says over um, rewarding can also have some negative benefits too. So in our house, like this is our, our approach where just where I just want someone to try it and just give it a chance and then they can make a decision from there. So I'm not over incentivizing or over rewarding, but I'm just like getting them to a certain place where they can say they've given it a fair shot. Okay. so. Here are some of the things that I say in uh, my class at the beginning. Number one, you've already paid for a seat in this class. And, and in some of the classes I teach, I have an online, a fully online section and an in-person section. And so I say, if you register for the in-person section, like you paid for a seat. So to get your money's worth, like, come, okay. And then, also, uh, we talk about like a mountain, and yes, you probably can earn an A or a good grade if you don't come and if you do all the online stuff and if you're, you know, an independent student, but will you ever actually get to the peak of the mountain and what do you think you might miss if you just never give coming to class a chance? And then um, another thing I also try to talk about early on is that according to research, this is what we know about students who attend in person versus who listen online or, or who listen to recording online. And, and basically, if you are having an in-person experience in the moment, you remember that better, you recall more, uh, you engage and learn more. So sometimes uh, the research will convince them. And then the last one is I encourage them to try their own experiment. Like, give me four chances. Show up four times during the semester and see if it makes a difference for you. And usually when they get to that, you know, four class mark, they can make an educated decision about whether or not I'm 
my lectures are worth it, I guess. So, and, and then if it's not working for them, then at least they gave it a chance and I feel better about that too. So that's kind of a, like my benchmark now. Okay, so let's talk about the examples. So this is uh, likely the reason you all showed up here today is to talk about these more specific examples. Um, so I said that this idea of trying to game things a little bit more and trying to focus on incentives rather than punishment. I um, started to incorporate in my classes, and I'm, I'm going to give you some of the details, but if you want more detail, ask me later. Um, a coin toss. We would do a coin toss at the beginning of new a new chapter. So I cover chapters usually one chapter a week. And on the first day that we were covering that new chapter, we would do a coin toss. I try to make this as fun as exciting as I can um, in terms of, you know, the students walking in and saying, who's feeling really lucky? You are the one that's going to flip the coin today. Oh, you're not feeling lucky? Okay, not you. Over. So we tried to make it a lot more fun. Um, the students would come in, they, uh, we would flip the coin, not necessarily at the beginning of class, but we'd flip the coin. If it landed on, let's say, heads, we would have a five-question quiz, okay? Tails, we didn't. Um, would you be surprised, you'd probably be surprised to hear that often uh, when it would land on t heads, my class would cheer. And the reason they wanted to do this five-question quiz is because I'm going to give you the details. Um, if they, if those five, <laughs> this is, it was a pretty big carrot. If this five question quiz, if they, at the end of the semester, however many we have, which we don't know because we're flipping a coin, um, we, we will average that out. If the average is higher than your, one of your exam, uh, first three exam scores, I will swap it. If it's lower, it just goes away and it doesn't impact them at all. Um, so that was a pretty big incentive, and I, I got students showing up to class um, very regularly uh, with the coin toss. Um, all right, let's see the next one. A, a gaming approach. Um, so the first time, I'd use a lot of cahoots, a, a lot of different kind of online um, games where they could engage with their phones and um, different things like that. The first one I did, um, you could see they kind of were like, oh, another Kahoot. Okay, we'll pull this out, we'll do it, but whatever. At the end though, um, I the first place winner, I said, hey, come up, um, you won a dozen donuts, a coupon for a dozen donuts. Now, I didn't go out and buy these big prizes. I, I did buy I did buy some prizes, but it wasn't for purely the intent of buying prizes. I like to pick my favorite charity, one of my charities, and one of my favorite charities this last year had a um, one of those fundraising events where you buy coupons and it, you're redeeming it for something cool. And it was donuts this year. And so the students were like, whoa, she's donuts? <laughs> Food items on the line? And I got so much more participation and um, engagement on that. And the students would show up. Um, uh, group, I kind of mentioned this earlier, this idea of think, pair, share, um, trying to do a lot more group discussions. Anytime I do a hands-on, I, I would try to do, see if I could do it even in small groups. Um, so we would do, and in my class I'm psychology, so uh, we did operant conditioning. I did a activity where I went outside and I made, I often made myself, like I put myself in uncomfortable spaces to be able to have some fun. Um, um, going outside, they had to identify an activity that I had to do. Um, they came, I came back in. We played a version of hot cold, but it, it, also talking about the different components of operant conditioning. Um, and then I had them break up into small groups and see if they could do a similar kind of activity themselves. So trying to make it as fun as possible in these think pair shares. Okay. And I know we just have five minutes. I tried to That's talk okay. fast. So. We'll, we'll see how far we get. So one um, thing that I've tried in um, a large enrollment course is that I make attendance a participation option. Meaning if you come, it counts for you. If you don't come, it doesn't count against you because there's other participation options that you can do to reach a certain benchmark of points. So the objective is to get to 100 points by the end of the semester. And if they come to class, it's 10 points every time. And so they just 
do less work. But if they have to miss a class, it's no big deal because there's a 10-point participation option that they can make up, and they, they can choose from a list of options. So you can go to the next one. So this is what it looks like in my syllabus. Um, in, on some weeks, I tell them that they're going to get participation points if they come for that one. But I also have some surprise ones where it's like, thanks for showing up today. And I decided to do, make this, t I decided to make today a participation points day. So not every lecture is participation points, but a handful are. And then, so here's what it looks like on Canvas. And sometimes I put these up after a class period and I say, everyone who gets points for this one did these things, they came to class, they participated in this way, and then uh, they get 10 points. So sometimes they turn in a note card, sometimes I just, you know, collect their names on a Kahoot quiz or something. So that that's worked pretty good. Can I say one thing real quick about the, um, so I've used the index card thing as well in some of my smaller classes. It works really well as a means of checking in with every student every single class period. Um, there's a smaller class that I teach um, that had usually around 70 or 80 students and I'd have the students fill out a note card. Sometimes it was, hey, I have a question about the content or I want you to go into more detail or I had an example about this content or just check in with me and it was a great way to kind of flush out oh I'm not reaching these students these these couple of students they are not really uh, connecting with me in the material or and these other ones I've, I've got them hooked so. yeah yep I like note cards they're cheap too one dollar for 100 okay so another thing is um, I try to flip classroom approach in a class that has been a traditional face-to-face. -face. And so in this particular class, it had a, a, well, it had a, like I wanted to still keep utilizing some of the stuff that I'd made online during 2020 and 21. So if you go to the next one, like this was, this was my thought process. So it used to look this way, where lectures were in class, guest presenters were in class, labs were in class, and then students did homework at home. And then it went fully online and everything could be done at home online. And so now the flip version is, like I still use my online lectures that I recorded for here because they're actually good. Or like, like they're, you can hear me and I'm in my office and it, so, um, they do those on their own before they come to class. And then when we have guest presenters or guest speakers, that's in class only. And they're not always recorded. It depends on the guest and if they're okay with that. And then labs are done in class or at home. So if they come to class, then they have the benefit of working in small groups and getting feedback from me and from other students. And they get a head start or they get their homework all the way done. And if they have to miss class, they can still do it at home, but it's more independent and still takes you know longer. So they still have to do homework as well, but once again, the benefit of coming to class is that they get a head start on homework, they find a new peer group, they can collaborate. Also, I tell them, you'll get more if you come more. So um, the ones who, who come regularly, if they're there for a guest presenter, then on, on an exam, uh, what I do is I give them four options for an essay question. They need to answer three of the four. And one of those four questions is always about the guest presenter. And so if they were there for the guest presenter, then they have four options instead of three. If they weren't there for the guest present presenter, they can still you know, do the other three options and still get full credit, but it, they just don't get as much to choose from. So this one is, you could be a winner. So at the end of every unit, I just keep track of attendance and it's not worth points or anything, but, um, but everyone who's come, they, their name goes onto will of names. We spin and like Jen, I have a little drawing like Jimmy John sandwich or uh, salad at, at Cafe Rio or, or Costa Vida or something. Anyway, um, or a sweatshirt or a water bottle, like those kind of things. And I usually do three drawings, but sometimes it's things like 
you'll get a one week extension on any assignment of your choice or something like that. And that uh, has been fun. The other thing that I am planning to do for next year is I collected feedback from this year's students in this class. And I said, if you came to class, tell me why you did and what worked and what made it worth it. And if you didn't come to class, tell me about your experience. And so my plan is to compile that data and share that with the next group so that they can make a decision based on other students. I think we're done. Yeah. We're out of time. Yep. So let's thank our presenters so much.